to order the uh, Capitola City Council regular meeting uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Um, Mr. Reed, do we have a report on closed session, please? Certainly, Mayor Bertrand. The City Council met to discuss two pending litigation matters, and the City took no re uh, reportable action on either. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to say that this meeting is cable cast live on Charter Communications Capital, Capital Channel 8, yes, and UV, uh, UVerse uh, Channel 99, and it's being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday the following rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Channel 71 on and also on Comcast Channel 25. Um, our technician tonight is Kenston Rivera, and as a reminder, please close your cell phones, and if you want to come up, sign your name on the sheet if you'd like to be recorded. Are there any additional materials? Uh, one set of additional materials for item 8D was distributed. Um, it's an updated version of the bail schedule for consideration. Thank you. Okay, any additions and deletions to the agenda? Staff has no changes. Okay, so this is time for public comments. Anyone would like to speak? You have three minutes on an item that's not on the agenda. Hi, Tony. Thank you, Mayor Bertrand. Um, Mayor Bertrand requested that I come in tonight and just talk a little bit about the chamber and what we do. And it's always a good refresher for the residents who are watching at night um, to see can what you the just chamber stop for does. A second? Uh -huh. um, um, can we give her more than three minutes if you need? Up to four or something like that, because you do have a lot of things to say. Thanks. I can do it in just a couple of minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, anyway, we were at the Easter egg hunt last Saturday, and that's one of the things that the chamber does. And we had uh, over a thousand kids, plus their parents attend, and it's just kind of a free for all. And you know, people come up and tell us, "Well, you should have rules and all this stuff." Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> no, it's a, a free event for the families, and we want them to have fun. No rules. So it took us two hours to plant the eggs, but of course they were gone in five minutes. Um, but it is a popular event, but that's just a sample of what the chamber does for the community. We do the Halloween Children's Parade. Um, we put on the Capitola Art and Wine Festival. Uh, we do Surfing Santa. We try and do a lot of fun things for the community. Um, of course, the Art and Wine Festival is the main event, and it, it's grown over the years. And this is our 37th year doing the Art and Wine Festival. Mm -hmm. And we have quality artists. We get about 40,000 people down there, but the village is the perfect place to have it. Uh, people come down and they shop, not only at the art booths, but in the shops down in the village. For it's, so it's a big boost for the community. Mm -hmm. um, so other than the special events that we do, um, we're here for the community. And people think, oh, you're just a place I can go get a brochure in. I said, no. <laughs> you know, we do a lot of referrals and networking with our community businesses. And we work hard at that. We promote our city um, through social media, paper ads, magazines. Uh, things like that, and um, I have one employee that just pretty much does that all day long. And um, we're here for the city if anything needs to be done. Um, for instance, back in 2011, when we had the main pipe burst down here in the Pacific Cove um, Mobile Home Park, we were there working closely with the city employees and helping to get those people out of there, get them fed. Um, the city put up lodging for them. And I worked with the employees to go d out and, and see what the businesses needed, plus the residents. So we started a grassroots effort, and we collected money from 
locals and we were able to fund a number of the businesses in the village. Um, we were even out there digging out mud from their stores and they had to have carpets replaced, you know, cleaned out, their merchandise was gone. It was terrible. But that's one thing that, you know, we'll get in and work on with the city. Um, so we're prepared for things that come up and um, we're happy to help the residents in the area. People that relocate to our area, we have relocation information and we'll have them come in the office and sit down and go over everything with them. Mm -hmm. uh, same with visitors. Um, they'll come by or they'll call us or even get on our website, which has been totally updated to get information. Mm -hmm. And my staff and I, we've all been around Santa Cruz County. I've, I'm a native. Um, for so many years, we pretty much know everything, the lay of the land. And so people will call us and we always answer our phone. Um, it doesn't automatically go to voicemail. Mm -hmm. And we give them that one-on-one -on -one service. And when they come in the office, we do that as well. So um, we're here to be part of the community and work hard for our residents and for our businesses here in Capitola. Are there any questions? No, but uh, recounting what happened during the flood it was um, ex truly an extraordinary effort and I'm glad for your part in doing that. A lot of people were devastated and mm -hmm. the fact that the chamber was part of that is truly amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, Well, the no, whole community got together. It was many people in the community, you're absolutely right. Yeah, and worked um, together. Okay, thanks, okay. Tony, for Thank coming you. forward. Thanks for coming, Tony. Yeah, really. Um, for the late arrivals, um, this is a time for public comment. If you'd like to come to the podium and say something on an item not on the agenda, please come forward. And if you want to write your name down, it will be recorded. Sure. Um, my name is uh, Alan Cable. I live in Topaz Street. Um, I wanted to thank the uh, council and the works department for approving and implementing the traffic calming measures in the jewel box. Um, certainly in my opinion, it's made a great improvement <coughs> in the level of traffic that goes through there in the evenings. Um, it's made it a lot, a lot much more pleasant to, to live there. Um, the speed controls on Jade Street have made a huge improvement in Jade Street. It used to be a racetrack and now it's really a much safer street. So I wanted to thank again the council for that. I think it really worked out well. Um, we do notice, of course, that when enforcement is in place, uh, it's much better. There are a lot of people that still either are not aware of the signs or ignore the signs, which is to be expected, and I think we, we talked about when we, when we discussed this. Um, so I would really encourage the police department to continue the <coughs> process of enforcement, <coughs> random enforcement. But, um, but I think, uh, certainly in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of my fellow residents of Topaz Street, it has made a great improvement. So I wanted to thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else from, oh, great. <coughs> Hello, um, my name's Dana Ingersoll. I live on the corner of 47th and Topaz. Um, so I'm also here to thank you for the traffic calming measures that have um, been in place and um, the safety, especially on Topaz Street, is so much better. I was actually able to like slow down and talk to my neighbor <laughs> at five o'clock without, and just like uh, my friend was bringing her son down the street and was like, yeah, it's okay to bring him down the street, you know, on his little bike, like a three-year-old. So that's how all the other streets are in the jewel box. It's nice to finally be having that experience. Um, I would say that it's been my observation living on that corner that the Topaz block has been much more effective than the 47th Street uh, in terms of who is, um, you know, how many people are respecting the signage or not. Uh, there's still a lot of traffic on 47th Street, uh, so maybe that could be considered around enforcement, but we're definitely very grateful. Um, and I also agree that the uh, Jade Street it's much safer for pedestrians to cross. People are slowing down. I'm going slow. To, I mean, it's just, it's, it's 
but much better. So I know it's been a long, drawn-out process. You guys have been very patient. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your comments. Um, anyone else? Okay, bring it back to City Council for um, staff and City Council comments. Welcome back, Ed. Maybe you have something Thanks. to tell us about Washington? Yeah, I, I just want to make a note that I missed uh, the meeting two weeks ago. I was actually back in Washington, D.C. I sent as Capitol's representative on the Metro Bus System Board, and <laughs> we sent a coalition of people back uh, to Washington to lobby uh, for some revenue for new buses, and uh, we've been doing this for the past three years, and I've been fortunate to go uh, the last two, and we've been very successful with achieving grants. So uh, that was my uh, reason for missing the meeting uh, two weeks ago. I just want to comment on one other meeting. I, I also sit as a representative on the, uh, it's now called the Santa Cruz Santa Clara Roundtable, which is the follow-up of the select committee, which basically deals with the jet noise we've all been living with for the past five years. And that meeting was Wednesday, and um, we're just trying to figure out how that committee is going to work into being a representative uh, for uh, to prevent, to, to attempt to prevent any other types of uh, FAA interaction by changing routes that will affect our communities. I do want to note that uh, the big item we dealt with two years ago was the uh, transition of planes from a, a route that was called BSR over Santa Cruz to the surfer route, which now flies over Capitola. And the, the vote of the select committee two years ago was to move that route back to the Santa Cruz route. and. Um, the wheels of the FAA turned slowly, but uh, we did finally get that their uh, group uh, will be meeting, the entire FAA group will be meeting with the airlines and the, all the representatives, not the public, but uh, the representative on uh, June 24th and 26th to make the final decision about what's going to happen with that route. So we all anxiously await to see if those planes uh, leave Capitola. So that's my comments. Hi. Well. While Ed was out lobbying, I was at the Easter egg hunt down in Capitola, on Capitola Beach, and I just wanted to um, to really thank the chamber for putting just an incredible event together. My daughter is four years old, and she and I have attended it every single year. There, she, uh, Tony forgot to mention, there was 2,000 more eggs this year than last, to um, so that every child that attended not didn't just have to get the one or two eggs they were walking around or walking away with uh, big buckets full um, and I also want to thank the Capitola candy company who donated candy and stuffed animals and had special golden eggs for a number of the children that attended so it was a beautiful event and a beautiful day overall so thank you to the chamber um, it was a great event okay. and I have nothing to the report oh, okay um, I think one thing that was forgotten on Tony Left's, I believe Tony's not here. The Easter Bunny came. The Easter Bunny was always there. Comes. The yeah. Easter Bunny always comes. And last time I, c I did not see the Easter Bunny, but there was this huge line that stretched off into this distance of kids that wanted to be with the Easter Bunny. It was truly amazing. That Easter Bunny had a lot of stamina, let's put it that way. Um, uh, for those who know, uh, at St. Joseph, the uh, Stars Dinner is going to happen at 5.30 tomorrow. Um, I think that's something a lot of people in this area do know about. Um, I was um, thinking about something. When my wife sends me down to the store to get something like ice cream, which she did last night, she always allows an extra 15 to 30 minutes. And that's one of the things that happens when a lot of people know who you are. So I was walking down to the store again today, and um, someone went through the intersection, <coughs> stopped, didn't back up, but yelled at me, hey, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> so I went over, and I did not know this person, but um, she informed me that um, she lives on Riverview, and she's a little upset about the parking. Well. The solution, according to her, and it's been mentioned many times here, is that if people would only clean out their garages, they could put their cars in the garage. So with that, uh, Steve, is there something coming up this weekend in terms of a citywide garage sale? <laughs> yes, I, I've been hearing rumors that Capitola or somehow we're doing a citywide garage sale. 
Am I incorrect? I may be wrong, but. No, there is a, a community-wide garage sale. Uh, people can sign up um, and there'll be an advertisement and maps showing all the houses that uh, are participating in the garage sale. Mm -hmm. It's a great time to uh, clean out your garage. Okay, and when is this gonna happen? Saturday, 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 April 27th. Thank you. And you okay. Can, you can sign up from our website. Okay, Larry, it is coming up. I apologize. For the That's okay. Um, Sorry, Steve. So the, your, the question was about the community garage sale? Yes. Yes, it takes place on Saturday. Okay. Um, all around town. Um, we've taken sign ups for the last month. We'll be publishing a map and directory tomorrow, both on online as well as we'll have maps in front of C City, City Hall. Um, we've advertised in the local papers, and I, at this point, we have about 100 participants. Great. So. so there will be a lot more parking spots available in Capitola after this garage sale. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I went on a great tour the other day, and um, maybe, hopefully, someone from the police department could talk about this, but... Um, I read a lot of articles when you know something happens that a kid has to report they've witnessed a crime or somehow they've um, been involved in one and the interviewing could be very um, traumatic for this person. So uh, Capitola has a, um, and the chief, I'm hopefully we could do a report on this. Uh, we have an interview room that's available to law enforcement, the DA, et cetera, and it serves Santa Cruz County. And the basic idea of this is to provide a room for the kid that is very, um, like being at home, you know, or in your playroom, you know, to try to reduce the trauma for the child. And then also all the people from law enforcement, the, the attorneys, di district attorney, maybe the police that are uh, arresting or somehow involved in that case are there, but they're not visible to the child. So I think this is a wonderful thing that is now here in Santa Cruz. And I commend the, um, the departments that have been involved in this. And I think that is it for me. Thank you very much. So, Jamie, do you have any comments from the staff? Not this evening. Not this <coughs> evening. City clerk? No. Oh. Okay. So let's move on to the consent calendar. So all items on the consent calendar be passed in one vote. But at this point, I'd like to leave it open to those in the public. If there's any items on the consent calendar that you would like to pull or comment on, this is the time to do it. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the City Council. I'll motion move the open. consent calendar, or I'll second. second. Okay. I'll go with I'll second. Okay. See, he's back. From, okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any objections? No. Okay. So now we move on to general government public hearings. Um, item 8A, consider options for banning flavored tobacco and vaping products. Do we have a staff report? We do, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Thank members you, of the council. The item before you this evening, uh, as mentioned by, by the mayor, is staff research related to flavored tobacco and associated concerns. In addition to options for banning flavored tobacco uh, or vaping products, should that be the direction of council? You'll recall that uh, during the March uh, 28th council, me council meeting, um, council directed staff to research options to ban flavored e-cigarettes uh, or vaping products in our city and explore additional tobacco laws beyond what we currently have in existence uh, through our code, specifically uh, and potentially a tobacco retail license uh, to prevent youth exposure to tobacco. Um, part of our staff research uh, identified that uh, per the Department of Tax and Fee Administration, Capitola currently has 16 tobacco retailers. Now, there's an error in the staff report on page, run, page one. It uh, states uh, 19, that's a, that's a typo, it should be 16. Of those 16 tobacco retailers in the city, uh, our research found that nine of them sell flavored tobacco only, in addition to tobacco, cigarettes, cigars, etc. Nine sell flavored tobacco only. Those nine do not sell flavored vape products. Three sell flavored tobacco and flavored vape liquid, also known as pods. Two of the 16 sell flavored vape liquids only. And two of the 16 um, sell flavored tobacco, uh, have no sales of flavored tobacco or flavored vape. In other words, they only sell the traditional mm. tobacco products, cigarettes for instance. Uh, before you um, on display is uh, an overview of our city and the location of those 16 tobacco retailers. 
the highlighted green areas are the two schools, Opal Cliff and uh, New Brighton Middle School, and then the yellow highlighted area is the library. Uh, none of the 16 are within close proximity to schools or libraries, as is um, mandated within our code. There's a distance of 1,000 feet or beyond, and you'll see that the majority are on the 40, 41st Street corridor. I thought it was important to provide a specific definition of tobacco product because it's very broad. Uh, and this definition comes from the California Health and Safety Code. Um, and I'll read most of it. Uh, tobacco products is a product containing made or derived from tobacco or nicotine that is intended for human consumption, whether smoked, heated, chewed, or any means of ingested, ingestion, including but not limited to cigarettes, cigars, little cigars, chewing tobacco, pipe, <coughs> tobacco, and snuff. A tobacco product is also an electronic device that delivers nicotine or other vaporized liquids to the person inhaling from the device, including but not limited to an electronic cigarette, cigar, pipe, or hookah. And then importantly, it also includes any component, part, or accessory of a tobacco product, whether or not sold separately. And so that is the specific definition in California of a tobacco product. Our current law here in Cala, uh, or Capitola, uh, under our Muni Code, um, chapter 8.38, uh, and this has been, the most recent update was in 2015 to this code, this chapter. Uh, sellers must request ID. Business is not allowed, as I mentioned, to sell tobacco within a 1,000 feet of a school or public library. Business shall visibly post uh, Penal Code Section 308. That is a section that provides the punishment if someone was to purchase tobacco for someone under 28. Uh, also post signage related to Business and Professions Code 22952. Um, and they shall visibly post signs at each entrance uh, stating a warning um, that if you are to purchase or facilitate the purchase of tobacco for underage persons, there would be some legal ramifications. Those are, that's the current uh, restrictions within our, our code. Some of the youth safety concerns related to flavor tobacco, and this is from a 2016 uh, Surgeon General report. Um, we know that e-cigarettes entered the marketplace around uh, 07, and since 2014, have been the most commonly used tobacco product amongst uh, U.S. youth. Uh, a 2018 study conducted by the Surgeon General showed that more than 3.6 million U.S. youth currently use e-cigarettes. That is one in five high schoolers and one in 20 middle schoolers, according to that study. Hmm. One third of high school and middle school students who use e-cigarettes have used cannabis in their e-cigarettes. Um, and we know that they are often marketed and sold in kid-friendly flavors such as bubble gum, cotton candy, uh, chocolate, peanut butter. In 2009, the FDA banned flavored tobacco in cigarettes except menthol. The study also shows that 80% of uh, uh, age 12 through 17 and 75 of 18 through 25 who currently use tobacco report their first tobacco product was flavored. And that's according to the uh, FDA population assessment uh, of tobacco and health. And we know that vape aerosol is not harmful at all. In the staff report, you'll find in the second paragraph on page two, uh, some of the uh, potential negative exposure from vape aerosol. Can, can you, I, I wanna read that one more time, just so vape aerosol is harmless or is not harmless? Is not harmless. Vape aerosol, according to the experts, the medical experts, um, exhaled into the air is believed to emit harmful substances including heavy metals, volatile and organic compounds, and ultrafine particles that can be inhaled into the lungs. The slide before you here uh, is a 2016 local study that was conducted here in the county uh, by the health, uh, Healthy Stores for a Healthy Community. This is based upon store observations and public intercept surveys, in other words, surveys of people exiting tobacco retailers and, and what they found during those surveys. You'll see that 34% 30, of the stores in 2013 um, sold e-cigarettes and that increased to 57% in 2016. 63% of the stores that they surveyed sold flavored non-cigarette products which often had kid appealing flavors such as grape, watermelon, et cetera. Um, a high percentage of the stores, 84%, sell menthol cigarettes. 60% of the stores near schools 
self-flavored non-cigarette tobacco products. And then lastly, 16% of the stores place toba tobacco ads at kid-friendly locations, which is the eye level uh, for children. That's based upon a 26 study done here in the county, 2016 study. Now, some of the arguments in opposition of flavored tobacco bans. Flavored tobacco users will simply order online and visit neighboring communities that have been prohibited the sale of flavored tobacco, of course. Prohibiting the sa sale of flavored tobacco will drastically reduce retail profit, re retailer profits and may put them out of business. Uh, this unfairly punishes local businesses. Some of those local business owners are our community members. Adults like flavored tobacco and flavor bans unfairly punish law-abiding adults. There are already laws in place that prevent youth from having access to, access to tobacco products. The most recent was the 2016 change in California law uh, that increased the minimum age to 21 from 18. Um, the opinion that we don't need to ban more products, we need to do a better job enforcing current law. And then flavored e-cigarettes help people quit smoking traditional cigarettes. Restricting the sale of flavored tobacco will make it harder for those individuals to quit smoking. Now here's what some of the other areas or jurisdictions in California are doing as of January 1st. It's actually more recent than that. I think it's closer to the beginning of, beginning of March. Some of these are best practice. I know it's important that we provide staff um, uh, research and, and understand best practices in our area and throughout the state. 31 uh, jurisdictions in the state have existing flavored tobacco restrictions. Of those, 14 have total bans on all flavored tobacco. Six um, allow flavored tobacco in tobacco-only stores. Those are the stores where no one under 20, you have to be 21 years old or older to enter those stores. Six jurisdictions uh, allow for flavored tobacco in tobacco-only stores. Six of the jurisdictions have a total ban with the exception of menthol. Four have bans that utilize school buffer zones. So no flavored tobacco within the zone that they have designated within that city, a thousand feet for us. Others have a uh, more narrow uh, zone. And then one of the 31 has a total ban on e-liquids only, also known as pods. So some of the options to consider for council based upon our research. Uh, option number one would be to direct staff to proactively monitor all retail tobacco establishments and enforce violations of Title VIII, Chapter, 8, Chapter 838 of our Muni Code. So that's status quo. Option two, direct staff to prepare a new ordinance banning the sale of all flavored tobacco and flavored tobacco products in the city of Capitola. Option three would be to direct staff to prepare a new ordinance banning flavored vaping products only. If council directs staff to proceed with either item or option number two or three above, staff recommends council, council also direct staff to implement a local tobacco retail license program, program prohibiting a tobacco retailer from conducting business in the city without a valid TRL. This will require adopting a new and separate ordinance in itself. And in addition to the above options, three options mentioned, several changes should be made to Title VIII, Chapter 838 to reflect updated definitions and updated law, uh, most specifically the change in the age from 18 to 21 that uh, became effective June 9 of 2016, and then changing the ordinance language in our current codes from minor to the word youth to be consistent with the language that's contained in all of the state laws. That concludes my presentation. I'm more than happy to answer questions. Any questions of the chief? Yeah. No? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, chief, I just wanted to um, maybe ask a little clarification about the enforcement mechanism. Um, you referred to uh, proposing if there were one of the bans elected by the council tonight that the we would institute a tobacco retail licensing and would and that would be the enforcement mechanism um, we would have to assure that they all apply and then they would be um, inspected maybe annually to determine that they aren't carrying these uh, banned products before their license is renewed that's correct they would have to apply for a license on an annual basis renew that license at January 1 of each year of that license that we would potentially issue to the retailer would con contain conditions um, that we decide upon 
that would regulate that license. Any violation of those conditions based upon our inspection would potentially cause for that license to be either either suspended or revoked. Very similar to our uh, entertainment permitting program here in the city. I see. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I just want a clarification. Um, are there pods that have marijuana that are for sale right now in Capitola? We did. Um, there, there may be. We don't know for sure. We did an inspection um, about a month ago with a number of our retail outlets and didn't find any violations. Now, that was not a complete audit or a covert inspection. Uh, marijuana is being ingested by way of electronic uh, cigarettes uh, or vaping products. Um, so I can't say for sure that it's happening, um, but I, I, I know of stories where it is clearly happening, and some of the data that we have compiled does indicate that many youth and adults use e-cigarettes to consume cannabis. So I'm a little behind the time. Where, where are e-cigarettes available? I mean, how do you buy those or get them? They're available through retailers. Just through retailers? So yeah. the marijuana pods normal retailers or do you would you have to go to uh, a, a marijuana uh, vendor it would have to be a licensed cannabis retailer to sell a cannabis or a Product. cannabis liquid okay got it okay thanks You're um this time uh, open to questions from the uh, audience here if you have any comments okay bringing it back to city council for discussion who would like to jump in so I was the one who brought this forward, and I'm really excited that we're entertaining it tonight just because it was I was asked not too long ago. So the fact that it's on the table makes me feel that it's, it's important to us. And I think it's our responsibility as council to hold ourselves um, accountable and responsible for what, what sort of things are sold to our community, especially our youth. Um, as I was lucky enough to sit down with the Santa Cruz <coughs> County uh, Health Department, we have some people, some specialists here tonight. Thank you for coming um, to really to to teach me about the impact of of these pods that our students are having access to, our students, our children, um, and so I was really surprised that I of what I heard that, and you saw the numbers t tonight. So. Um, if I may, if there's, I would like to make a motion on the table already um, for option number two, which would be to direct staff to prepare a new ordinance banning the sale of all flavored tobacco and flavored tobacco products in the city of Capitola. I'll second it. Okay, um, so you're not concerned about uh, flavored vaping? That's included. You're including that, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and how about the uh, tobacco retail license program so that if we would choose option two or three tonight that would include the TRL the tobacco retail license so that would come into place so that our our police department can enforce our new ordinance or policy um, should we move forward with okay so that two. would be included mm -hmm. and then there was another recommendation to change um, minor to youth I think that's correct change the language in our current code uh, reflecting the current age restriction from 18 to 21 and then uh, change from the word minor to youth. Okay, you'd include that too? Yes. I'm okay with a second. Okay, so any comments on the motion? Well, I, if I may, thank you, Mayor. Um, and I just, I wanna say that I'm gonna support the motion um, even though, and I also say it, it feels a little bit awkward to have just approved an ordinance approving the sale of marijuana in our community um, and now we're going to turn around and and ban other legal products so that seems a bit um, awkward to me and I felt like I just need to acknowledge that and maybe though to justify that uh, if in my own mind if no one else um, I am concerned about the availability of these products for, um, you know, young children and the impressions that they make, um, and we can't stop it all, but I think that this may help um, uh, keep it from, um, you know, their use. Those statistics that the chief presented about the numbers of middle schoolers and high schoolers that are vaping and starting out on flavored products are I think very compelling um, 
And even though we are approving the sale of marijuana in our community, retail sale, um, it is very highly regulated, uh, very highly controlled. Um, and so I think that this is just um, one means that we can use to continue to, uh, I think, protect the youth um, uh, and guide them and toward good habits and good practices. So, um, so that's why, even though I, I do recognize that kind of uh, irony this evening, um, I will support the motion. Thank you, Yvette. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Um, number one, I want to thank uh, Councilwoman uh, Brooks for bringing this to us. I think it's a great thing for us to deal with. And uh, number two, I, sub I share Councilman Story's uh, concerns of, uh, and the possible conflict. Um, I'm going to try to soothe you a little bit and, and work Please. your way through that because uh, I, I opposed uh, cannabis when we even brought it here uh, to, to bring it on the agenda to have it legalized in Capitola. Um, I became comfortable with that because, you know, the research I did on, on how we got to that point was uh, the voters, overwhelmingly adults who vote, uh, wanted legalization of marijuana. So that's not something I felt compelled to overturn when, when the numbers were so significant. Um, the idea of the flavor pods, um, I see that more as this is something that is appealing to youth, and uh, this is where I acknowledge Councilwoman Brooks and her uh, tenacity for, for pursuing this, because this is where I think we can draw the line. Uh, we can acknowledge the fact that adults and uh, voting, uh, people of voting age wanted cannabis, and so our, our task is how we deal with that and, and introduce it into our city, whereas I don't see a benefit uh, to the community with the flavor pods. I think it's uh, destructive for youth. And so I'm able to separate that and draw that line and say that, uh, you know, we can draw the line and, and, and not allow the flavor pods and yet closely regulate the introduction of cannabis. So I too will be supporting this. I feel it's uh, rather insidious of the industry to introduce flavored um, components in their products. Uh, to me, it's a blatant uh, attempt to get youth addicted and um, so I definitely will support this with that a call for the motion all those in favor aye aye any opposed none opposed it passes thank you very much Yvette I appreciate it so let's move on to 8b consider resolution allocating the 2019-2020 road maintenance and rehabilitation account funds uh, Steve I think you're coming forward with a report thank you Good evening, Mayor and Council. Let me just get the, the agenda states we are looking at allocating the uh, road maintenance rehabilitation account funding, otherwise known as SB1, tonight. Um, just I'm going to give you a little background on our, our road funding allocations that we go through every year. Currently, the city has what I call two dedicated road funds. These are funds that need to go into transportation and road maintenance. Um, first is the road maintenance and rehabilitation account, um, also known as SB1, um, probably better known as SB1. Um, that's a state-funded um, allocation of funding through gas taxes and vehicle registration fees. Uh, the city receives approximately $170,000 annually from that fund. The other dedicated road fund is the local tax measure D, um, which is funded through sales tax, and we get approximately $300,000 annually for that. Um, both SB1 and Measure D must be used for transportation projects, as I stated. That includes road rehabilitation, repaving, uh, complete streets implementation, which is accessible designs for vehicles, pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit. Um, that's really a big um, component of both these tax measures is when we redo a street that we allocate space and we design for all modes of transportation. Um, projects can also be, these funding can also be used for vehicle emission reduction, congestion relief, and implementation of safe routes to school issues, um, projects. So they so have, um, both funding measures have certain requirements uh, for SB1. There is an annual adoption of a resolution uh, by May 1st, re listing projects uh, receiving SB funding for the following year. So tonight we're considering where we uh, wanna allocate our 2019-20 um, allocation. It's a little unfortunate because it 
this May 1st comes before our budget, but um, those are the state guidelines and uh, we try our best to, to meet that. Um, and we also have to annually report in October on the actual expenditures made. For Measure D, there's, uh, it's a little less stringent. We have until July to give them a five-year um, projection of our expenditures. So that's something that we'll be considering when we review the budget and go through the capital improvement program uh, later this month and into June. And there we have an annual audit of actual expenditures that's concluded. So we have two current road projects um, that are been on the books for different amount of time, but are essentially ready to go. And um, we're here to talk about funding for those. First is the Park Avenue sidewalk project. This is a new sidewalk from McCormick Avenue to Cabrillo Street. It does include a new crosswalk at Park Avenue at Cabrillo. Its original estimate was $470,000. Unfortunately, as time has gone by, it's been on the books for about four or five years now. Current estimate is $985,000. Um, I would say the first estimate was significantly low. We've had to include a retaining wall that we hadn't anticipated in that. Um, there's some safety features with the crosswalk, which we are including and just the passage of time projects and especially in the last probably two years we saw with the library construction costs have gone through the roof so um, the project plans and specifications are complete for that we are ready to go to bid on that and if this is approved tonight we will be taking bring that to bid at the next council meeting the other um, project that's been delayed and had some funding has actually had the allocation the original allocation of um, sb1 money for this past year was a reconstruction of 42nd Diamond and Ruby Court. That's just the repaving projects and new compliant curb ramps. Uh, the original estimate was $770,000. Uh, price has now increased to $1.3 million. Um, and we're about 90%. We could get ready to bid this project if, um, pretty quickly. Uh, we This was originally part of the project that we, we paved Park Avenue, Kennedy Drive, and Monterey in 2016. Uh, because of the cost of that project, of doing those streets, ate up our entire budget, we, we deferred this project at that time. So this is a copy of the spreadsheet um, that's in the staff or in the agenda tonight. Um, we have enough money to build one of these projects. Um, and my recommendation, I think the Park Avenue sidewalk project is a higher priority. It uh, provides a, a key pedestrian link between the Cliffwood Heights neighborhood and the village. It provides safe routes to school passage to New Brighton, or at least helps with that. Um, and it's been on the books longer. Um, so my recommendation tonight is that we allocate the SB1 money from last year and which is 1819 and the 1920 SB1 money to the Park Avenue sidewalk project and we also move the measure D money that was supposed to go in the paving project next year to the Park Avenue sidewalk project. That'll give us about 1.1 million dollars for a one million dollar um, project at this point. Any money obviously left over would, would remain with the city and um, could be allocated to other projects in the future. Regarding 42nd Avenue paving, I think as part of the budget, um, we're gonna go through some reprioritization of our projects. Um, we can see where this falls. I know Clare Street is another area that we're all very interested in trying to improve. So we can, rather than in tonight, try and determine which allocations we're gonna make in the future, um, we'll make that part, as part of the uh, budget session. So like I said, my, my recommendation is adopt a resolution allocating the 2019-20 and reallocation of the 2018-19 road maintenance and rehabilitation count SB1 funds to the Park Avenue side pro sidewalk project. That's my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions of Steve? Sam? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Steve, how long has the 41st Avenue project um, been 40 on? 42nd. The 42nd. 42nd, 40 second, okay. yes. Um, that was first part of the paving project, so it was p probably initiated in 2015 um, and was supposed to be constructed in 2016. Okay. Uh, and if we were to approve this um, allocation and reallocation, um, 
when would you be able to start or contract out the Park Avenue sidewalk project? I, I guess I'm a little leery now of escalating cost. All right. So we not. are, like I mentioned in my report, uh, we are ready to go to bid on that. So if this is approved tonight, we will be coming back, I think, at the next meeting, certainly by the second meeting, maybe, but I'm waiting for her to okay. approve. You would approve the plans and authorize me to go out to bid. We would then probably open bids in June, award a contract by the end of June, begin con you know, construction <coughs> this summer. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. No questions. Um, in terms of reallocation, the SB1 that was previously allocated, um, is that a special uh, reporting requirement or is that fine? So we have to report on our allocations. Last year we told them we were holding it over, so reallocating it to another project is not a problem at this point. If okay. we had spent it already, it obviously would be. Yeah. So if we're under the $1.1 million, um, we could hold that? You said we could keep that? In a special fund, or how, how does that work? So, is, you know, we're allocating it to a certain project, right. and we got underbid. So, what, what would that? So, any money left over at the end of the project, because um, it all goes into a, a project fund, will be, will we'll, that'll be the general fund money okay. that, that we hold on to at the very end. That's the last we spend, and then we could reallocate that um, to another project when we get the next project ready to go. Okay, so we captured it. How is it that we miss the? Uh, the uh, retaining wall issue the in initial designs and preliminary layouts just didn't think it was, was required when we finally got into the detailed design they realized the cut for that retaining for that area it's this is a 600 park avenue mm -hmm. was higher than they had anticipated and it's just one of those things when you go from preliminary design to final design okay thank you so at this point uh, open up to those in the audience any questions seeing none come back to um Council here for comments and motion. I'll move the staff recommendation. I'll second. Okay. I just ha I just have a comment. I I, I think uh, you know early w when this council came together in January we had discussions and there were some people here representing uh, concerns about repaving streets and one of the ones that came to point and we were doing a budget review was Claire's Avenue and I, I just wanted you know it. it, it I hope we all understand that, that doing these projects is becoming more and more significantly harder to accomplish. Um, we went through four years of, uh, of some massive paving, I consider, uh, with, the, with the benefits of Measure O, which delivered us about a million dollars a year. And I think, Steve, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it, you know, our, our pavement index is maintained at ground zero with about $500,000 a year. And the fact that we basically put nothing into it other than what comes from Measure D and SB1 that adds to 470,000. So we're at that status quo, and we we barely do slurry seal. So we're not making any significant improvements, um, which, which it doesn't bode well for what we're ever going to do for 42nd and for Claire's and uh, other. You know, I think Steve even mentioned to me that 41st Avenue is now in a little disrepair, Capitola, that intersection. And that's going to be a costly repair also. So it's something for us to think about as we're looking forward. You know, the, the money that we're going to have left over is going to be, you know, barely, barely we're barely going to cover this project. And um, just something for the council to think about as we're moving forward, that these, these street repairs are just significant. But on a positive note, uh, Sam, you were here when I think Sandy Erickson was here and we were trying to get, she said, I will never be here when sidewalks are on Park Avenue. So I'm, you know, I might send her a note in Texas and tell her we've got sidewalks on Park Avenue. So that's my comment. Yeah, I um, uh, live in Cliffwood Heights and I've known people who walk on um, Park Avenue and they walk their dogs there at night, including my wife at one point, And I tell them, don't do it. There's just no sidewalks and coming down that road at night. Uh, could have been an accident. So I'm glad to um, see that we're going to get this project rolling, and I know a lot of the neighbors have been waiting for it. So with that, I call for a vote. We already have a motion, I believe, right? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. No Thank opposed. you, Council. Thank you very much, Steve. So item C, uh, consider fee schedule for fiscal year 2019-2020. So I think our... City Finance Director has a report.
Good evening, Mayor and Council. As Mayor mentioned, this next item before you is the fiscal year 2019-20 uh, fee schedule. Um, as just by way of background, the current fee schedule is adopted by Council following a, a comprehensive study in November of 2015. And at that time, the consultant recommended that we review the fee schedule on an annual basis and implement a CPI increase. We've incorporated that review into part of the budget process, which is why we're here right now. Uh, most fees since then, since the fee schedule was finished, uh, have increased by the CPI each year. The exceptions would be fees that are set by the state, which are notary fees and um, something about a circulating a petition. And then the recreation fees, we don't always increase each year. This year, the uh, CPI rate for the Bay Area is 3.87, which is what staff is recommending for, for the fee increase. And then just by way of a history, those are the last three years since we've implemented the fee study on what the increases have been. Um, this year we also have a couple of new fees that we're proposing. The first is in the miscellaneous fees category and that's an anim annual cannabis license fee that we're setting at 2,550. And I'm gonna, I have some other slides that'll go through how we calculated these fees. Um, under recreation, we have a teen club, um, fee as well as a K through six program. These are both brand new programs that our new recreation supervisor would like to implement. And the reason for the 60 slash 70 is resident versus non-resident. And then in the building department, we are proposing three fees, which is a building reinspection fee, resubmission plan check fee, and a building permit extension fee. So on the uh, cannabis license fee, we've set this up as cost recovery and I met with um, our community development director and the police chief to figure out what would what would be the process for these licenses and how much time would be spent. So we came up with um, 1.5 hours of a senior planner and before I go any further, just these are fully loaded salary benefits. These aren't what people make per hour. Um, fully, uh, three and a half hours of police sergeant time and 10 and a half hours of police officer time. And then there's a $1.56 rounding to get to the even 25.50 on that one. Oops. On the teen club and the K-6 youth programs, recreation staff surveyed 24 similar programs that are offered throughout the county, looking at various uh, components of those costs, uh, are scholarships offered, what types of things do the kids do when they're there, uh, when is it offered, ages, staff to participant ratio, and the location. And then we tried to set a fee around the midpoint of the programs that are provided, which still provides a public service, but also provides adequate resources for an enrichment focused program. And on the building fees, the building reinspection fee is set at $125 and consists of about 15 minutes of development service technician time and one hour of a building inspector one. Uh, the resubmission plan check fee is an hourly fee and that's the building inspector two fully loaded hourly rate, so however much time that one takes. And then building permit extension fee is set at 176, and that's, uh, uh, we're estimating one hour of building official time and a half hour of development services technician time. So our staff's recommendation is to conduct the pu public hearing that we're doing right now, adopt the resolution repealing, resolution 4132, which was the resolution that uh, <coughs> approved the current fee schedule and then at the same time that would adopt the new fee schedule and that concludes my presentation I'm happy to take any questions okay any questions so Jim I would like um, at some future date to have um, our recreation director come up and describe what the um, teen club is going to be and it's very exciting to hear that this is in the works uh, thank you Nikki and um, that's one of my questions. Another question was the coastal development permit appeal. I noticed that's at zero. Is there some reason uh, Coastal Commission designates that at zero or why would it be at zero? Ah, yeah, Katie, okay, thanks. So typically a development permit is tied to either a design permit with a coastal development permit or a conditional use permit with a coastal development permit in those unique circumstances when it's just a coastal development permit and it is appealed 
then it would have no fee attached to it. So, and that's per the Coastal Commission. Well, that's per Coastal Commission. Yep. So okay, that, that's, that's come from them, not from, from us. us. Okay. Okay. That. Uh, okay. So it's basically that I'm saying that. That's what I was but wondering. But for a home, for instance, if a house design was appealed on Depot Hill and it required a coastal development permit, there the appeal fee would um, would be required because they're also appealing the design permit. If somebody appealed just the findings attached to the coastal development permit, so they were just appealing the coastal development permit. At that point, the coastal commission has. Um, said that we cannot require a fee for okay. okay while you're here do we have special fees for adus we do we have two different fees for adus one for if it's reviewed administratively by staff and that would just go through staff would review it and send out a final local action notice mm -hmm. on the adu approval during building plan review so um, and that fee is I think it's just about six hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Correct. And then, if any um, ADU that doesn't comply with all the standards of the code is required to get planning commission review, mm -hmm. and that permit, when it goes to planning commission, is just a little over seventeen hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay. Other any questions? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So at this point, uh, any of those in the audience would like to come forward and make a comment? Seeing none, back to City Council for action. Yvette. Yeah, I'd like to go ahead and move to um, approve the fee schedule for 1920, just with some a couple of additions and some requests. Um, I believe that we would have to add the tobacco retail license fee to this before approval. Correct. Okay. No. And so, so well, not before oh. approval. I'm sorry. I mean, when we come back with the it would be um, the license fee, then we'll implement the uh, with the license then we would set the fee at that time and just add it to the schedule at okay that time. okay um and then i i w would like to um just mimic what mayor bertrand was saying to to nikki if i would love to see parks and rec department come back not just about the after school um, pilot program but about all of the summer programs that are taking place there's a lot your department's doing and i would appreciate a presentation on all the good stuff that's taking place and then lastly, um, I, so I sit on the Child Care Planning Council, which is apart from what I, what I do here. And one of the biggest um, concerns or troubles that business owners who are interested in opening child care centers face is, well, there's two of them. It's finding a location. And secondly, it's, um, it's use permits. It's the permits that they have to obtain at the city level, in addition to state licensing and all these other fees so when I was going through this I noticed that we have some fees associated for use permits not sp specifically stating for child care centers um, but if one wanted to open a child care center um, this is on APC1 they would uh, have to pay these costs so I'd like for staff to explore possibly a grant program that we could offer to business owners who are interested in opening child care centers, um, not necessarily to waive the cost, we can possibly look at using our dedicated children's fund to offset those costs for business owners, um, but I'd like to look into to doing that. There's a huge need in our community. There's only two child care centers currently in Capitola, and the wait list are over two years long, so there's a definite, definite need to um, entice more people to come and open businesses here in our community. Those are good points. And um, having gone through child care for many years and um, coming up with that difficulty, I totally agree with you. Yes. So any other comments here? No. Okay. I, it, is that part of the motion? I mean, are we just given staff direction to look into those? Because I, I'm, can we do it that way or does it need to be part of the I motion? I took it as staff direction. I think we can leave the motion to just uh, approve the fee schedule for 2019-20 and then give staff direct uh, outside of the motion. I'd be more comfortable with that. I took it as staff direction, but I, not part I of the motion. I have asked for future discussion of. Yeah, that's what I saw yeah. or heard. Rather. But which is future. not a 
It doesn't need to be a motion to do yeah, that. No, okay. it's not part of the motion. I, I, the motion that you made was to approve the, the, the fee schedule, which I'm, I seconded. Uh, but in, in addition to that, you're asking to look for possible grants and whatever else was asked for. I think that's, that's outside of the motion. Right. Yeah. That's my understanding. And also asking for a report uh, later from and Nikki. And the report yeah, from right. right here. Okay. So not part of the motion. No, not part of the motion. Those were just requests. Um, Sam? Well, I just wanted to get clarification from the mover mm -hmm. that that's acceptable to her. From what I understand, when we request things from staff, I have to get a general consensus. And so I waited to offer these um, requests at this time so you can see how it was related to the fees. Um, but the motion on the table is to simply pass item 8D to yeah. tonight. But um, I would hope that I can gain the consensus from the rest of our group tonight to move forward with my request to have Parks and Rec present and for staff to explore um, a grant program to offset costs for child care centers. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I, I just want to clarify, Mr. City Manager, you can add to this. Uh, any council member can ask for any for staff right. to look into anything it doesn't need a consensus so so you're free to do that and you can then get, you I can have get a the boundaries list. Hold on, no. uh, you can, well, now you the can floodgates are open quantify <laughs> that if you'd like okay. so, well, let me start. Yeah, really <laughs> i'm just yeah, trying to keep us there. on track with item d okay. so so we do have a motion and a second on the floor i i, I will just <laughs> just to put a little info out there about how this process works so right now in our muni code the way it's written is that council members can request an item in a future agenda any council member can uh, request an item in a future agenda at an open meeting uh, I think the intent of the council behind that was, as Councilwoman Brooks suggested, to be able to kind of get a you know read of the room to make sure that the item had a little bit of traction. But yes, technically, any council member can request an item at a meeting. That's the process to do so. So it doesn't need to be part of a motion. Okay. So I, I perceive that we've asked to have a presentation from re recreation at a future meeting, and we've asked for staff to get back to us on possible grant opportunities or what we can do to support or encourage or entice. Uh, centers it's too. already on the to-do list. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I um, uh, <clears throat> to to me, it's not a technicality. I think um, anyone on this uh, board has an idea and then brings it forth, and then we debate it. And um, so, asking for general consensus before we've had a, an a option to hear all the ins and outs of that issue and how staff reports um, based on their um, analysis to us, then I want that debate. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those in, and no one against. Okay. So let's move on to um, the bail schedule. And who and that give one's us me? our report? Oh, great. Okay, oh. good. I'm sorry. I did not know it was you. Yeah. That, oh, that yes, from the clerk. Okay, I should read it, these it, things. It's all right. It's, I think it's on the next page. It was um, there, yes. And Thank you. I, I believe Jamie is handling Frantically. Be, be slow. <laughs> I'll, I'll stall by, by explaining that this is part two of the items that we're asking you to approve tonight that are charges that the public would pay. The first was the fee schedule, and those are for services rendered by and determined by the amount of time it takes. The second here, the bail schedule, this is fines and penalties. So this is a separate item um, from a fee and is, is handled as a separate resolution. Um, some of our code sections uh, are general in the sense that they are misdemeanors and infractions and there is a general fee um, set for those and for others we wish to establish a specific fee um, so that's what we're doing tonight we have identified 12 areas where we recently passed ordinances similar to what we're talking about with the, the tobacco um, once we have put something forth and you have um, determined to codify it we then say, okay, if there's a penalty involved, this is how much the penalty should cost. So that's the process we're doing tonight. Um, and we have 12. Many of them are related to the bicycle um, work that we did recently. Uh, we have two items that we realized never had fees attached. So those were omissions from previous updates. So there are two items for that. And then there's one where the language was revised. So we're just making the bail schedule match um, the way the uh, item is described currently. And the, this is the schedule for kind of the, the overarching. So if there is not a specific fee, this is what rules um, for misdemeanors and infractions. And this is an, a sample from the new schedule of the various 
types of fees um, that we're looking at implementing. Um, as you can see, for cannabis processing and cultivation, um, the police department recommended a high penalty bail. Um, for others, the uh, PTD, personal transportation devices, and for um, the racks and such, it would be a, a much lower level. And it is the police department that recommends these. They look at other fees and try to find something um, that is comparable. So you have a, the full uh, bail schedule in front of you. There are also some language cleanup um, items, just typos, other things that we've discovered over time. Um, so the recommendation is to approve the resolution, appeal, repealing the last bail schedule, and adopting this current bail schedule. Are there any questions? Yes. Any questions? I have none. So, um, I, excuse me? You do have a, oh, I'm sorry. I do. Yeah. I, but I, you I go looked ahead. and now you see me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Linda, just one question. Thank mm -hmm. you for that report. Um, on the revised um, um, bail schedule that we got, there was an item referencing uh, bail by mobile home park owners to submit resident list, which was deleted on the revised schedule. Because it so no longer exists in the municipal code, so it does that not need to be. Yeah, that was pertinent to when we had mobile home rent control. Yes. And so it's okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. So many of us get re um, complaints about garbage cans in public view on non collection days, um, leaving them out. So how would that be facilitated? How would someone make a complaint and how would this proceed? This is only $50, but. I, I get these complaints all the time that the garbage cans are left out um, in public view. So, how would this work? They would need. Um, would the I, would the chief? Would you? I can. I just don't know how it works. Our garbage will take that call. Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Um, so we do receive the complaints. Okay. Um, they notify, and then we f we follow up with um, letters or communications to the owners. Um, that they explain what the, what what the the ordinance is and what the penalties are if they don't cooperate, um, and then we follow up to see if they've cooperated. Um, and but it is still a, it's a complaint based. Uh, we don't we don't go around looking for the trash cans out, but we have I, I would say in the last two years we've probably received about a half a dozen. Okay, uh, would a neighbor or whoever's complaining, let's say someone walking down the sidewalk, fearful they might bump into something and fall. Um, would they have to give their name? Um, I don't think so. I, I, I don't believe they do because we just it, we, we know because it's 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 to a residence. So we, we notify the residents that it's out. There's no there's no name attached to the uh, the, the complaint. I don't I don't believe I, I, I'd have to go re look okay. to see what we've done in the past. Okay. I, I'm just want some clarification. So when people ask me, thank you. So at this point, any one in the audience would like to make a comment. Uh, seeing none, back to City Council for a motion. Comments and motion? Approved staff recommendation. I'll second. Okay. Any more discussion? Nope. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So it passes. So with that, we go on to item E, second reading. Good evening. I think you're Mayor, up. Council members. Yes. Um, here, we're here for the second reading of uh, the ordinance to remove optional CalPERS membership from future councils. The first reading was passed at the 32819 uh, council meeting. Um, just a reminder for those who d don't choose PERS, there's an alternative called PARS, which is a Social Security um, replacement. Um, this ordinance would only affect future council members or future councils, excuse me. Um, and so we, I hope I clarified the, the additional cost for a CalPERS retirement annually is about $325 more than if a council member participated in PARS. Um, last time that was a little unclear. Um, it is a requirement of PERS to have this in general government. So um, that's, we're, we're performing this, uh, this reading. Um, so at this point, um, I'm here to answer any questions. From the council members. Any questions? Any questions of Larry? Okay, Ed. 
I just had a question on the city manager and I asked him to clarify. It was my impression that the second readings were normally just on the consent agenda and so I was oh. curious why this came back. So I just figured since he shared it with me, he could share it with, uh, with the rest of the council why we're having a second reading at, at an uh, open forum. Well, yes, that is a, that's a requirement of CalPERS. Neither one, either the first or the second reading can be on the consent agenda. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, all those in, uh, is there a motion? Public? Public. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, all those in the public would like to make a comment, please step forward. Seeing none, back to the city council for a motion. And I'll make a motion to approve staff recommendation. I'll second. Okay, it's been. And yeah, if I just made, I didn't support this the first time around, so to be consistent, I'm going to not support it the second time around. Okay, so um, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Uh, myself. Yourself, okay. Okay, so the ordinance passes a second reading with yes. the mayor, uh, Mayor Bertrand, Council Member Brooks, and Council Member Bottorf in favor, and Council Member Story opposed. Okay, thank you. With that, I call for adjournment. Thank you very much for all those who attend the Capitola City Council.